All right, if you have your Bibles, I want you to get them out. We're actually going to go to a whole bunch of different verses, um, and so it'll be on the screens. I'm going to wrap up this week, along with my tag team partner, Michael Brodeur, we're going to wrap up this week uh, the message that we've been speaking on about the kingdom of power. Uh, just my heart for our church and my heart for every believer at our church is, is that you would actually understand the inheritance that has been purchased for you by Jesus and that you would fully receive what God wants to release to you. I have a burning passion in my heart that believers would receive the inheritance Jesus purchased and as citizens of another kingdom would actually be able to access the resources of that kingdom. This is maybe very prevalent right now as we look around the world and it seems that the kingdoms of the world are shaking. Things seem uncertain, unsettled. We look at the economy, we're not sure what's going to happen. We look at what's happening around the world with nations, we're not sure what's going to happen. There is all this uncertainty, there is all this unsettling, there's all this fear and worry and anxiety because kingdoms are shaking. But I want you to be able to actually recognize you don't belong to any of those kingdoms. You are a citizen of the kingdom of heaven. And the Bible is very clear that that kingdom is unshakable. It does not matter if every kingdom is shaking. You belong to a kingdom that's not shaking. We are not connected to the economy of this world. We are connected to the economy of the kingdom. And the resources of that kingdom are available to you. And you have a king who is your provider and he is your protector. And so I want to see believers that actually recognize I'm a citizen of another kingdom. There's an inheritance that has been purchased for me and I want to walk in that. I want to receive that. But the other thing is this, is I want to see believers who actually walk in the authority God has given them and understand that not only are they citizens of this kingdom, they're ambassadors of this kingdom. They represent this kingdom. And this kingdom is not a kingdom of talk, but of power. That God actually wants to come and set people free. He wants to heal them and he wants to set them free. And the kingdom of power just means this. The name of Jesus is higher than every other name. And the power of God is greater than any other power. There is no name that you're going to encounter. The, the name of cancer is not higher than the name of Jesus. The power of depression is not greater than the power of God. And so we would say, I want to see everybody step into this thing that says, I'm a citizen of heaven, and I have a right as a child of God to receive the inheritance Jesus purchased for me, and I'm an ambassador that has to walk in authority to represent the kingdom. That is the message we've been talking about. And so, but, but in that process, one of the things I realize, especially when we're talking about healing, and then also some freedom, freedom issues, deliverance issues, but freedom issues, is, is that many times... There are questions that we wrestle with, sometimes unknowingly are wrestling with, sometimes knowingly wrestling with, that if you don't answer these questions, they, will, they plant a seed of doubt in your life that gets you to lean back rather than lean in. Now, most of you in this room are not in a spot where you would tell me God doesn't heal today. The gifts of the Spirit are not for today. The power of God doesn't, doesn't happen today. The reality is, if you've lasted in our church for any length of time, you're probably not believing that the gifts of the Spirit are for today. So I'm not talking to people that I'm trying to convince God heals today. But many times, even when we theologically believe God heals, there are still questions that if we don't answer them, when they come in, they plant a seed of doubt that gets us not to abandon the concept of healing or deliverance, but gets us to lean back a little bit rather than lean in on what God is telling us to do. Rather than lean in on believing for full healing and full breakthrough for both ourselves and the community that we walk with, it gets us to lean back a little bit because there's little things that we have to ask. And so in our journey of healing, myself, Michael, different ones that have been on this journey for decades now of really believing God for healing and praying for people that are sick and praying for people that need breakthrough and freedom, I have encountered questions from people that seem to trip them up a little bit, not necessarily in abandoning their faith around this issue, but enough to kind of not quite sure if they're going to press in or really believe God, especially when the answer seems delayed. So I'm just going to go over a few questions with you, but I want to lay this foundation quickly. Colossians chapter 1 verse 15 says this about Jesus. 
The sun is the image of the invisible God. Let me read it in the amplified version. The sun is the image of the invisible God. The amplified version puts it this way. He is the exact living image, the essential manifestation of the unseen God, the visible presentation of the invisible. So, so the, the, Paul's writing to the Colossians and he's saying this. If you want to see God, if you want to know what God's like, you want to know what his character is, you want to know what his nature is, you want to know what his will is, if you see Jesus, you will have seen God because he is the exact representation of the Father. This is what Jesus tells Philip when Philip asks him to say, we want to see the Father. And Philip says, how long have you been with me? If you have seen me, you have seen the Father, because Jesus says, I am the exact representation. If you want to know the nature, character, and will of God, look at Jesus. The reason why I bring this up is because any time, and if you're going to be somebody who pursues healing, either for yourself or somebody else, if you're going to be somebody who is believing God for breakthrough and freedom in some area of your life, for yourself or for somebody else, you are going to run into questions and confusion in some areas. But, the, but, but when we encounter questions, when we encounter confusion, our default mode must be we go to the Word of God and we look to the living Word that was revealed in the Word of God. We are going to look at the life of Jesus to get our answers and we are going to look at the Word of God to get our answers. Because if I want to know what God's like, if I want to know uh, uh, what his nature is like, what his character is like, what his will is, I go to the word of God, I look at the living word revealed in the word of God. And this is the foundation of how we answer. The questions, I'm about to, the questions we're about to ask, we answer them in this way. Are you with me on that? Yeah. All right, thank you. I'm glad you are. <laughs> Everybody else, I don't know, I'm just going to preach to you today. Is that right? Just me and you, buddy. Here's, I'm going to give you just a, 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 kind of three main questions. The first question that comes up a lot around healing and deliverance is this. How do I know it's God's will to heal? Or how do I know that it's God's will to heal, uh, will to heal everyone? How do I know that? Well, let me just say a, a couple of things. First of all, this. Nowhere in Scripture do I find that God communicates to us or Jesus shows us that it's not actually his will to heal. In fact, I find the opposite when I dive into Scripture. When you dive into Scripture, what you're going to encounter is starting at Isaiah 53, which is the, the, uh, the prophetic word about what's going to happen on the cross when the Messiah comes, when Jesus comes to die on the cross, what he's going to do and what he accomplishes. It starts here. The new covenant starts with this. The new covenant was established with what Jesus purchased on the cross, and Isaiah 53 establishes this, it says this, surely he took up our pain and he bore our suffering. We just start with that. The pain that might be in your life, Isaiah 53 says, he took that up. He took it. It says, yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him and afflicted, but he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him. And then here it is. And by his wounds, we are healed. So we just start there where Jesus on the cross says, listen, what I purchased for you was I went to the cross to take your pain. I went to the cross so that you could be healed. Go on in the New Testament. When we look at the life of Jesus, Matthew chapter six, the disciples ask him, the disciples say, teach us how to pray. And Jesus comes and he gives them a prayer, a prayer that we would, we call the Lord's prayer. It's really the disciples' prayer. But Jesus says, let me, let me show you how to pray. And the first thing he tells them is this, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. And he says this, we are allowed to pray. We have the legal right to pray. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Michael will touch on this briefly today, but the concept is just this, is that if it's not in heaven, I have a right to pray against it in the earth. I have a right to pray against it. And, and I, listen, I grew up in an environment that was like, you don't really know God's will. 
We would say, God, whatever your will is. And what I was saying was, I have no clue what your will is, God. And it was kind of that like, you know, God's selective in who he saves and he's selective. We don't really know. And God's up there just with a dartboard at some level, kind of throwing a dart. And sometimes somebody gets healed and sometimes somebody gets saved. But we never know. And the Bible goes, no, you can be clear about God's will. He said this. He said, your kingdom come, your will be done. Well, how do we know what your will is, God? Well, look at heaven. That's my will. And so we say this. Well, sickness isn't in heaven. Pain's not in heaven. So therefore, I have a legal right to understand the will of God, the will of God. In other words, if Michael comes to me and says, I've been in back pain for 20 years. I've been praying for it. It's not healed yet. I still look at him and say, this, this is what I know, Michael. Your back pain is not the will of God for your life. God's will is not that you would live the rest of your life in back pain. Well, one of the reasons why we have to settle this issue is because there's something about a community of believers that settle that issue. I, I told you, I was on staff at Bethel for 18 years. Bethel is known around the world for healing. Literally, people fly in from around the world with some of the worst cases of sickness. And, and, and I mean, when chronic or, or when they've been diagnosed with something that, that just is incurable, they fly around the world to Bethel. Because there is a community of people. When people ask me about Bethel, I said, it's an interesting place. You go somewhere where, I'm sure there's some people, where the entire community has settled this question. Is it God's will to heal? And so every person you run into is going to say, that's not God's will for your life. God's will for your life is freedom. God's will for your life is abundant life, and it's not sickness, and it's not pain. And so they've settled that issue. And I'm telling you, when I read Scripture, Mark, Mark said that, Mark mentioned this passage today, when the man with leprosy came to Jesus, and he said, if you are willing, you can make me clean. The man came and said, I'm not sure if it's your will that I would be, that I would be healed. If it is your will, I'll be healed. And Jesus cleared this up very quickly. He said, I am willing. It is my will that you would be healed. He's not a respecter of persons. Jesus isn't walking around saying, that's my will for you, not for you. That's for you, but not for you. He answered this question for us. Is it your will? He said, yes, it is. And so we settle that thing. And we say this. We believe that, it is, that from Scripture, I just do not find anywhere where God says, it's actually not my will to heal you. It's not my will to set you free. Again and again, we see a different thing, especially in regards to the life of Jesus. So, so this brings us to the second question real quick. People say, well, yes, it may not be his will, but does he use sickness to teach us something or to grow us in character? Again, I'm going to bring you back to the life of Jesus because I understand I have walked with people who have been sick or have been dealing with something, something that, had, that is some chronic thing that hasn't gotten breakthrough and things like that. And, and in their pursuit of healing, in the fight of faith, in their keeping their heart pure before the Lord and not growing bitter towards him, right. in their journey of drawing close to the goodness of God, staying anchored in the fact of, God, you are good, that yes, people gr have grown, in their relationship with God through encountering this type of stuff, right? Yeah. We live in a fallen world that has sickness and disease in it. Yeah. But here is what I would just say. I don't find anywhere in Scripture where God says he uses sickness or that sickness is in your life to teach you something about God or to grow your character. I, and this is very important because nowhere in the life of Jesus does somebody come to him and say, would you heal me? And Jesus says, actually, I'm not going to. Why? Because God's using this moment in your life to grow you and to teach you something. We don't see it in the life of Jesus. We do not see Jesus telling one person, I'm not going to heal you because right now God's teaching you something and growing you. 
I'm not saying that we can't grow in our faith or we can't grow in drawing close to God in the midst of whatever we're struggling with. I'm just telling you, I can't find a verse and I cannot see in the life of Jesus. Now, some people, and I just got this online, somebody was, they were actually doing honorably, it wasn't arguing, but somebody was like, well, you know, Paul said uh, he entreated God three times for, to, re, to remove the thorn of the flesh. The problem is, is that we are reading a ton into that verse. It's not actually there when we say that the thorn in the flesh is sickness. In fact, I would probably challenge everybody in this room, I have a theology of suffering, but suffering and sickness, I don't actually think the Bible puts together. I don't actually, I, I'm just telling you, I just, I don't see where, I just see that everywhere Jesus encounters people, he heals them. Acts 10.38 is a verse that actually associates the fact, in fact, put Acts 10.38 up there real quick. Years ago, the Lord spoke to me. I was probably 22, and he said, Bingham, there's two verses that will be the two legs that you're going to stand on in your life. One of them was Acts 10, 38. And it's talking about Jesus. It says how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power, and here's what he did. He went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil. He actually connects those that needed healing that, that the sickness that was there was oppression from the devil. Right, so I just, I don't see anywhere, I, when, when they say it's a thorn in the flesh, that verse, that passage has, it, it doesn't, it's not talking about sickness in that moment. I personally think, and other scholars would believe as well, that it's relationships. How many of you understand that relationships are thorns in the flesh? <laughs> Honestly, really. And that Paul's interaction with other apostles and other people that were betraying him and other things that were hard. But, but, but even then, it's not even clear if that's what it is. That's my, that's my best uh, guess from that. But it's very important that we don't take the thorn in the flesh passage and say, maybe God's not healing me and he he's wants me to have this because he wants me to understand his grace. It's just, it's just not there. And so, so in this thing, I'm just telling you, and there isn't... There isn't, a, it's really interesting. Jesus comes to us and says, here's your mandate. Heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse the lepers. Okay, God. He doesn't say, but there's going to be some people you run into that I actually don't want to heal. Like heal the sick, except for the people that I don't want you to, because I'm using that in their life. And I will tell you this as well, guys. If you actually believe that God uses sickness to try to teach you something, then you need to stop taking medicine and you need to stop going to the doctor. Now that sounds harsh right now, but my point is this. If I actually believe this is from God to teach me something, then medicine is actually going against what God is trying to accomplish in my life. Right? We say, well, I believe God is using this. I'm like, well, then stop taking medication. Because if you really believe that, then you're trying to counter what God's doing. The problem is, is I don't think God doesn't use, God doesn't use sickness to try to grow us and teach us something. He's not, he's not using the oppression of the devil. He literally says, I came to destroy that. He says, I came to destroy the works of the devil. And he said, you know, that thing that's trying to steal from you, kill from you and destroy you. He says, I came to give you abundant life, not that. And so, listen, I understand there's complexities around it, around, well, you know, I knew somebody and I kind of grew and that type of stuff. I said, I get it. I think the Lord can, can, can make beauty come out of, out of everything, right? But the reality is, is you have to sing this thing where God has not sent this sickness to me to try to grow me. I have every legal right to say, God, this is not your will. And I, and I am going to pray for and stand against this thing. And, but when I believe that possibly God is using it, when I believe that maybe God doesn't want to get rid of this right now, it's very hard to lean in with faith. Not just in my life, but for other people. Because this is not just about praying for yourself. This is going to be a community that believes for healing in the lives of other people. That believes for breakthrough in the lives of other people. And if I'm praying thinking, you know what, maybe God's using this in your life right now. Maybe, maybe this is actually God's will for your life right now. It's very hard to stand in a place of faith and authority in somebody's life. Okay, you're quiet on me. Online, are you with me on this thing? Amen. Online's cheering me on. Online's just amen. And they're running around their living rooms right now, just sprinting, waving flags, falling out on the couch. Um, 
again, I don't think anybody in this room would say that, that, that you know, God just sends sickness on people or, or God doesn't heal today. But we have to be a community that isn't leaning back, but leaning in. And I begin to lean back when I think, maybe this is God's will. Maybe he's trying to grow you. Maybe he's trying to teach you something. I say, no, I can't find that in the life of Jesus. Everybody that came to Jesus, he said, I'm going to heal you. All those depressed the devil, he healed. He, he didn't, there was nobody that he stopped and said, you know what, God's using this right now. I'm not going to heal you right now. So, so that, that's the legal right we have. The third question is this that we run into a lot. And then Michael's going to come up and wrap this point up for me. But is this. If it's God's will, then why, why, don't, why doesn't everybody get healed? Right. If it's God's will, why is it that I've prayed for people and they, have, and they haven't got healed? Let me just start this question by saying this. I don't actually have an answer for you. <laughs> and this is part of the tension that we live in and part of the problem that we have. Is there is, Michael and myself could both tell you real stories of people that we have pressed in for, contended for, surrounded in community, full of faith, believing for breakthrough, and we didn't get it, and they died. There are real stories of people that we have prayed for. It's been decades, and they haven't gotten breakthrough. We have to be able to live in the tension of unanswered questions. We don't like unanswered questions. The Bible says that we see in a mirror dimly. One day we will see clearly. But we still see dimly in the mirror in some areas. And in one of those areas is, God, why haven't you healed this person? Why did they die when, when I prayed for them? And I have to be able to live sometimes with this statement. I don't know. I don't know. So many people have been driven to wrong theology because they were so desperate to answer a question that they didn't have an answer to. And, and in, their, in their wanting, like we don't like unanswered questions. We don't like the discomfort of it. We want the comfort of an answer. And so in the moment of that uncomfortable situation where somebody that we prayed for, we lost. And listen, I want to tell you, CJ's family, my, my wife's family has been through much loss. And, 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 and people in their best efforts and trying to comfort and trying to somehow make sense of something that doesn't make sense. They say things that are just, it's just bad theology. They say like, oh, God wanted another angel. This was, God came. It was just their time. Rather than going, no, we live in a fallen world with the effect of sin and death. I don't know why they died, but that sickness was not God's will for their life. Well, then why did they die? I don't know. And I'll know one day, but I don't know right. But, but here's what, and here's what Bill in Reading has done so brilliantly. I was with him uh, when we were with them when his dad died years ago from cancer in 2004. And then Benny, his wife. And the ability to be able to say this, there are things I don't know, but I am not going to let what I don't know undermine what I do know. I'm not going to let unanswered questions somehow take out questions I have answers for. Is God good? Yes. That's solved. That's, that answer is solved for me. God is good. Is it his will to heal? Yes. And I have an unanswered question. Then why didn't this happen? I don't know. But I will not let this change what I do know, which is God is good. And here's why. Because my experience does not determine my theology. Part of, the, part of the tension that we live in is we so are looking for answers and we find answers not in the word of God, but in our experience. So we say, well, maybe it was God's will. Maybe he doesn't want to heal everybody. Maybe it was whatever else. And now my theology is not being determined by what I see in the word of God or by what I see in the life of Jesus. It's now based on my experience. And I want to tell you this, guys. I'm not going to base my view of God. My view of God, my understanding of his nature and his character's will is not determined by my experience. It's determined by the word of God. And I will look at the word of God to find out what his will is and what his nature and his character is like. It's not going to be based on somebody else's experience. This may seem harsh, but somebody comes and said, I prayed for 20 years and nothing happened. I said, well, I, I appreciate your story, but your experience isn't going to be what I base my life on 
of understanding the nature and character of God. That will be based on the Word of God. And we have to be able to come to a point when we don't understand our experience, even when I don't understand my experience, my experience doesn't submit to, my, the Word of God doesn't submit to my experience. My experience submits to the Word of God. It has to be how it is. And I want to tell you this, man, so many people, you know, charismatics get a bad rap sometimes because they're like, well, they just, their theology is experiential theology. I say, it's, the, it's not true. It's not true. And I would say across the board, I see people doing experiential theology. Yes. People that have not experienced something create a theology then. I was listening to somebody kind of in the Reformed camp, and, and they, they were talking through kind of why they believe is around the homosexuality issue, why they believe this person, it's just how God created them, or it's just the will of God. And I was listening, trying to go like, where in the word are you coming up with this? But they weren't coming up with the word. It was in this basis of like, well, this person prayed for a decade. They didn't get freer. The desire didn't left. So that must just be God's will for their life. I'm like, listen, I don't know. You pray for 10 years. That's not what defines it. Guys, you may have been praying for 30 years for healing. I'm telling you right now, when I read the word of God, I refuse to change my theology because what I see in the word of God is God wants to heal you. Why hasn't he healed me in 30 years? I don't know. I don't know. I just will tell you this. This is what the word of God says. Now, I'm going to have Michael come up because one of the big things that has to happen, if you're really going to walk this out, is if you're really going to believe God for healing and you're really going to believe God for breakthrough, you are going to face disappointment. And I think a lot of people have not really been discipled Father, we just pray for Preston as he runs just right now. Father, just stretch your hands out. <laughs> just rest. See, just, just kidding. I'm sorry. I shouldn't pick you up. Um, just conviction of the Lord setting in his life right now. Whatever you're doing, God, we just pray. Um, what happens is, is when disappointment comes in, a lot of us just haven't been discipled. And how do I navigate that? So many people have changed their view of God based off of disappointment. And there's real, guys, there's real things that we have, there's real things that we have to figure out in this process of living in a fallen, broken, sinful, disease-filled, death-filled world. As we're pursuing and believing God for things, we have to be able to, like, figure out how to navigate one of these things of just dealing with disappointment. So Michael, who is, uh, uh, Michael's a pastor here uh, on staff, pastored 30 years in San Francisco, was at Bethel for a decade or whatever. But Michael actually has brilliant, really, insight and understanding around some of this stuff. So I said, Michael, come tag team with me and finish off this last point. But, but Michael's going to come and just share for a few minutes Absolutely. around this Absolutely. Thank you, Jesus. Oh, it's so good to be with you and to be under this teaching about the power of God. I mean, it's so essential that we understand who we are, what our inheritance is, and also that we are ambassadors of this amazing truth that Jesus is Lord of all, King of kings. Anyway, it's so good. You know, Diana and I were saved into the charismatic world, but both of us, neither of us ever saw very many miracles. Maybe here and there, but we just didn't know how to believe for it. We met a man named John Wimber 40 years ago in 1984, and it changed our life, okay? And he became our mentor, our disciple maker in this. And Wimber actually taught us how to pray for the sick, and he also laid hands on us for anointing, okay? And so when we started our Vineyard Church in San Francisco in 19, literally 40 years ago, we saw tremendous healings and breakthrough. We saw the power of the enemy broken, addictions broken in people's lives. It was such an amazing thing. And for a season, we walked into certain grace. But at the end of that time, we started to see less and less people getting healed for a season. Now, we've always maintained this. We've seen blind eyes open. We've seen deaf ears open. We've seen, you know, people with, actually one time we, we were actually driving on the freeway. A woman literally crashed her car on the freeway. It spun around. She threw out, she fell out. She had no pulse and Jesus brought her back to life. I mean, we've seen miracles that are wonderful. Cancer's healed. But we've also been in that moment where we've prayed for something and it didn't happen. We prayed for healing, and the person ended up dying. 
We, so we know the reality of disappointment. And what I want to talk to you about right now, and I'm talking to two groups of people. I'm talking to those of you who have been dealing with lifelong physical struggles. Either maybe an accident occurred and you're injured, or maybe you've had a disease, something chronic in your life. You've had it prayed for many times and nothing happened, and so you've kind of given up. You just, I don't know if I want to subject myself to healing prayer again, because it won't happen again. Okay. On the other hand, there's those of you who have tried to pray for the sick. You've gone after it. You stepped in with all your zeal and with all your hope, and the person didn't get healed. <laughs> These are two different kinds of disappointment, but literally, they probably cover 90% of us in this room. Okay. How do we deal with this? How do we begin to understand God's heart, especially in the light of what Banning just said? The word of God is so clear and the testimony of Jesus is so clear. And when we pray thy kingdom come, there's no sickness in heaven. I can pray with confidence that there should be no sickness on earth because of the prayer that Jesus taught us. So what do we do? Well, first of all, I want you to understand from the scripture about Abraham and Sarah. Turn with me to actually Romans 4. And I want you to look at this amazing man who's known for his faith, but he didn't actually walk in faith sometimes. I think he got depressed. I think he got discouraged. I think he got disappointed. But I want you to look at this verse here in verse 19. What it says is this. Okay, now remember as we go into this verse that he had been praying for his wife to conceive a child for 25 years. Okay, he had been given a promise at 75 that he would have that from his seed all the nations of the earth would be blessed. Do you think of how many times he must have prayed? How many times he must have laid hands on his wife, on her womb? Oh God, give us this child. If you think about the fact that he went back to the Lord and said, Lord, let my servant be my heir because somehow this, this healing thing isn't working. Think about later when his wife finally says, hey, let's just give up, sleep with my handmaiden, Hagar, and we'll conceive a child through her. And God wasn't in, in pleased with that at all. Now think of this fact that now the angel of the Lord appears to them at this moment and says this. <laughs> it says this about that encounter. It says, in verse 19, and not being weak in faith, he did not consider his own body already dead. In other words, yes, he had considered it. Yes, he had given up hope at various times, but now here he is waxing strong in faith. He didn't consider his own body. He was around 100 years old and the deadness of Sarah's womb, because she was about 99. He did not waver at the promise of God through unbelief, but he was strengthened in faith, giving glory to God. See, when you're confronted with a dis discrepancy between what you know the Bible says and what you know the Lord Jesus modeled for us and your experience, you have to make a choice. You're put in a position where either you can say, yeah, maybe God just doesn't want healing or you can say maybe uh, I'm just not anointed or maybe whatever you know maybe the devil's bigger than God or all the different things that might come into your mind see you got to understand that we have an enemy that enemy is at work to undermine your trust in Jesus and so he's going to come with different answers like Banny was talking about we want answers well the enemy's right there to give you all the wrong answers and to undermine your faith in such a way that you will not Press in. Okay, but here's the deal. Look at what it says here. It says, He staggered not through unbelief, but strengthened in faith, give glory to God, and being convinced that he had promised was also able to perform. Therefore, it was accounted to him for righteousness. See, I believe that Abraham, as the father of faith, is giving us a word here. We need to be able to rise up in the midst of disappointment, okay? So let's say you're praying for somebody and they don't get healed. The first thing you do, well, other than just say, I love you, I'll pray for you again. Okay, I don't know why God didn't heal you right now. I'll pray for you again, come back. And you gotta remember, Jesus prayed twice for the blind person and Jesus also commanded the devils to leave out of the gathering demoniac more than once. 
Okay, so it's not wrong biblically to play, pray twice for somebody or to p- pray many times for somebody. Okay, but I'll pray for you again. But then the next thing you do is you come away with Jesus and you say, Lord, I just experienced a disappointing moment. I believed for your healing. It didn't happen. Father, I submit. I process this in your presence and I refuse to be disappointed because you are the God that heals. You are the God of the word and you are the word of God. And so I allow my heart to come into alignment with you. Okay. The second thing you must do is you must stand against the lies. Okay. Because they're going to come and you're going to find yourself just, you know, leaning back a little bit, just taking a little bit of a step away. And I believe that that is where the, the, the choice needs to be made. No, I will not relent. I am a son of God. I'm a daughter of God. I will stand with God in his word. I will stand with Jesus for what he modeled for me. And I will press forward. I will not relent. I will not take no for an answer. God, I'm going after it. And that means you need to stand against the forces of evil that want to undermine your faith. And then finally, you need to be able to process this issue of not having the answers. God, I've had many times where I've stood before the Lord and said, God, why? And one time the Lord spoke to me in the midst of a very difficult situation. It's not for you to know why right now. It's enough for you to know the one who knows why. I believe that God wants to raise up a healing ministry from this church that is going to radically, radically transform our region for Christ. I believe that we will be known as a church, as a place where Jesus shows up and heals people. Amen? Isn't that right? And so in that, I just want to close with a story. This one helps. It helps me a lot. There's a man named Mahesh Chavda, who's a healing minister who lives in South Carolina. And Mahesh was doing a healing crusade in Kenya. And he had all of his preachings planned, and he was going to do this over several days. And he got up and he preached a powerful message on healing. And then he called for the sick to come forward. And the first person in line was this little girl, a 12-year-old girl with her blind grandmother bring her up for prayer. And he thought, aha, we're going to go. And he prayed for the blind grandmother and prayed again and nothing happened. He thought, okay. But there was a little bit of a wet blanket on the healing meeting. Okay. Next session though, he preaches powerfully on healing and the same little girl with the same blind grandma come forth first in line. And he prays for her and nothing happens. The third session, the same little girl comes forward with her blind grandma and nothing happens. Finally, he's getting a little angry by this time. He's saying, I need to talk to her. No, but the third time, the fourth time, the fifth time, the sixth time, this little girl brought her blind grandma. But on the seventh time, the grandmother was healed. (laughs) And all heaven broke loose in the meeting. It was powerful, amazing. But... Let me tell you, a couple weeks later, he was just saying, God, I don't understand. Please help me to understand what, why it took seven times. And the Lord showed him that blind, a picture of that blind grand, grandma, and she had an octopus on her face. And whenever she prayed, I mean, whenever he prayed for her, one of the tentacles was broken off. But it wasn't until the seventh prayer that the thing fell away and she could see. Now, this doesn't answer every question about healing, but it does give us hope that ultimately we can press through in faith and see God be God on behalf of those that are hurting. Amen? So as we close, I just would like to ask anyone who's in this room, especially those of you who have had chronic problems and you've kind of just gotten a little sour towards healing prayer, Maybe you've stopped even asking for prayer. Can I just have you raise your hand if that's that's you? 
You know, I, I know it's, <laughs> there's things in my life. Can I have you just stand to your feet, those of you who feel that way? Can I have the healing prayer team come forward, please? And some of the leaders as well. And I'm going to give this back to, okay. But we want to see breakthrough in these lives. And we understand the disappointment you've had, the reason you've said, no, I just don't want to get prayer again. But I believe that Jesus wants to reignite hope in our hearts. So could I ask you to come forward right now? We need our prayer teams up here and a few of the elders if we can. But I'd like to invite those of you who have even grown tired of getting prayer to come. And just stand up here, stand in front. We'll get, we'll get to you. Let's make room and just kind of have you stand here because we're going to pray for you. And Diane, could you join me also and just you know, as you pray? But why don't you just close your eyes and let the Spirit of God begin to come upon you? See, there's three steps we want to take. And that is, first of all, to renew our faith in Jesus. So, Lord, I ask you to lay your hands right now on your sons and daughters. Let the power of the Holy Spirit come upon you right now. And I ask, God, that you break every lie, every derogatory, discouraging word that has come into my brothers and sisters' hearts. And that you, Father, would just allow every single falsehood to fall away in Jesus' name. Lord, we pray that you would cancel those those words that have been spoken. Oh, well, this is just God's will. You cancel the words that have been spoken that, that it's just not for you. Lord, I ask that you right now would bring your hypodermic and you would inject hope right now. You said of Abraham, he hoped against hope. Lord, I pray that you release the spirit of hope right now in this room and that you, Father, would just even from this time, release a new measure of healing for those who have been chronically and, and uh, long-term ill. Lord, we're asking for breakthrough now in Jesus' name. Amen.